Hi, this is Jeremy and welcome to today's episode of our IT OT Fundamentals video series. This episode is about software architecture and with me is Christian. Yeah, hi Jeremy. Um, before we start in today's topic, let's have a quick uh, dive into last uh, episode's topic. So last time we saw we talked about system administration and you were telling us about what is a traditional IT setup and uh, we're explaining how to set up the typical IT with virtual machines and with a demilitarized zone to have a more secure network and uh, to have a shop floor that is uh, secured by outside attacks basically. Um, today we are focusing a little bit more about software architecture so um, let's have a deeper look into that. My first question, I typically know software from, I have a piece of software that I install and then uh, it, it, after it installs, everything runs within this piece of software. But nowadays, I, heard, I hear a lot about microservices, about, about Docker, about Kubernetes, so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that part. <laughs> yeah, so traditional software is written as a, as a monolith. So you have one piece of software where everything runs on it and you install it like on one server and everything is fine um, and example for example um, is capware uh, capware is a tool to connect to the to the shop floor and you take it you might press double click on it you install it on a vm on a virtual machine and everything is fine um, if you take a look at more complex scenarios this can get complicated to actually maintain. So imagine now you do not only have like shop for connectivity, imagine now that you have an, an, an entire infrastructure. Um, it gets really complicated to put it all into one file. Also, if you want to now scale it out, if you don't want to run it on one server, but if you have so much so-called load, so, so many requests that you need to start separating it between between servers, just because one server cannot handle the load anymore. Um, for this, in the, in, the, in the current industry, in the growing industry, um, the microservice approach was developed. So instead of having one program with everything, you, you split it up into various sub-functions. Sub Each of these sub-functions is relatively stupid, um, but together, as coupled as a whole, they can fulfill a very complex system. And each of these these blocks, these sub-functions, it's called a microservice. So every microservice has a specific function and it's a, let's say, expert for fulfilling the specific function, but uh, this alone is not able to provide a full system as it would be in a, in a monolithic system. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you have the advantage that you can now um, take the same, let's, let's imagine you have a microservice that does that receives two numbers, adds it, and gives you the, the result, like a really simple microservice. Yeah. Um, if you would have like an entire calculator app in, as a monolith, um, it will be hard to, 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 to scale it out. Um, if you have this microservice, you could put it on multiple servers, and then you could have like a load balancer in front of it, and every time user sends two numbers, it could just switch between, between the servers, and each of the servers would have like this microservice running on it, um, so you would get to get the get to get the result of it. Um, disadvantage of that is actually that you have a little bit more complicated system. So the setup isn't that easy as just double clicking on it. You have to work with Docker and Kubernetes, Helm, etc. What exactly is Docker and Kubernetes? Yeah. So uh, in the previous session we talked about. Uh, virtual machines mm -hmm. and docker basically is is a software for containerization a container is similar to a virtual machine um, but let's just call it that it's a little bit more performance oriented mm -hmm. so a virtual machine is like really hard separation and docker container um, it it's re re relatively cheap to run a lot of docker containers on one, ser one server hardware because it kind of shares the operating system what do you say then with the microservice approach? It's the system itself is more flexible and uh, more secure in the form of if one microservice fails, then uh, because if, if the system fails, I have to reboot the whole system. But in this case, is it the same or? 
Uh, yeah, with microservice, you also you do uh, you cannot only um, load balance between it. You can also ensure independence from physical components. So if one server or one uh, server location burns down, um, we have the same microservice already on a different server. So whatever is in front of it can just detect. Okay, ah, oh, this server is is not responding. Maybe let's send all requests to to different server location. So this one actually increases the reliability, but it also makes things more 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 complex. So you don't have like one software or like one virtual machine with an ERP. Now we have hundreds or thousands of microservices running. And then each microservice running in a Docker container. And then you have tools like Kubernetes to manage this whole load of, of containers. So it comes with advantages, but also some disadvantages. And it's important to understand when to use what what approach? I think Netflix is using the same approach. Then yeah, they? exactly. So we talked in IT. We talked previously. We talked about what are the goals. Uh, what uh, what's really important in IT? And in IT, it's really important to have this capability to to scale out because now you might have like, like just like one or two users, but tomorrow you can have millions. With a monolithic software, you are bound by the hardware. With microservices, you can have you have a more initial complexity, but then you can just add servers as you want, and it will scale out. Maybe not not linear. Um, maybe it will not be that efficient as monolithic software, but you can handle much more data than a single server can. I when I'm talking to 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 customers, I nowadays often hear uh, OPC UA, MQTT, mm -hmm. and so on. How does that play in, in that field here? So yeah, so in, in general, there there are a lot um, there there are a lot of things things going on. Uh, it's also kind of emotional discussion: MQTT versus OPC UA, uh, Node Red versus w whatever. Um, what's important is to, and this is what we want to do here, is to always take a step back. So instead of throwing random words. Um, instead of throwing random words around, let's take a look what's behind it. So for example, um, you have things like OPC UA, um, which is actually client-server architecture. There is, of course, also the event-driven variant of it, but we leave this for an entire separate blog article. Um, so let's just imagine OPC UA is a client-server. Uh, you have also like REST API, so they are from the structure of it, they're quite similar. And then on the other side, you have stuff like MQTT, Kafka, um, in classic IT you also have li stuff like RabbitMQ, um, and they're related to event-driven architecture. So these are two different types of architectures, and a lot of the infrastructure discussion can already be done on the decision what type of architecture you want. Um, with the client server, just to, just to get started, um, what you have there is you have like like a website. You have your laptop, which is a client. You have a server, and your client connects to the server and fetches a website. Um, here we can have, for example, you have a you have a camera which takes an image. Um, it pushes it into the image processing algorithm using machine learning, and this one then pushes the result into a database. This would be, for example, a client-server architecture. Um, it's easy to set up, but imagine now you have like another thing, another solution coming in. Um, for example, you don't have like camera image processing database. Imagine now you want to visualize the image of the camera or maybe show it in a dashboard. Now you have to send the data from the camera, not only to the image processing, but also to the operator dashboard. Um, and then as more and more solutions come in, things start to look like spaghetti diagrams. So it gets more and more complicated. So initially it's easier, um, it's easier to set up, but if you try to share the data, it will get more complicated. So there we have the second approach, the event-driven architecture, where you have stuff like MQTT, Kafka in it. And what you use here is something called publish, subscribe. So you don't, uh, send it directly from the camera to the image processing algorithm, but you send it first to a so-called message broker. Um, and from there on, the image processing algorithm 
subscribes to all images, takes all Im data out of it, and puts the result back into the message broker. Um, this adds a, a little bit of complexity, um, initial setup time, because now we have an additional component. But now it's really easy for the operator dashboard, for example, to to take all the data it needs, just take it out, everything everything is available in there, uh, just takes it all out and uses it and uses it to, for example, to show it to the operator. So I only make as a as a operator or as a as a technician, I only have one connection to the message broker and exactly. The, so the for example the camera, the message broker, and then the system uh, to the message broker where they get the data from, instead of having like you said spaghetti of of connection points uh, that uh, from from each device to each software component that wants to use the the data. So it, in it You said in the initial setup, it's much more comp. Uh, it's not not much more, but it's a little bit more difficult to set up the the message mm -hmm. broker. But then later on, it saves you a lot of time and a lot of uh, probably uh, complexity on the on the later stages to manage all the different devices and everything. Yeah, exactly. And um, there are different implementations of it. So there is in the traditional IT, you have Kafka as a really good example um, of a message broker. But you also have like RabbitMQ, etc. And then we'll later come to the field of IoT. Um, MQTT is also also belongs into this category of message broker and of event-driven architecture. How does the unified namespace? I think it's a big buzzword now coming from the US. Um, every everyone in the US is now starting to talk about unified namespace. Exactly. How does that come into play here? Yeah, it is. Uh, we will later talk about go a little bit into the detail in the IoT chapter, but basically, it is a subtype of event-driven architecture. So, um, and and this one is really so in IT, it's it's known, and in traditional IT, you also have something like enterprise bus in manufacturing. This w currently, the client-server communications are dominating, um, and something like a message broker or unified namespace is really bringing new new principle in it um, so everyone keeps talking about it because now it's really easy to integrate a new solution so a new dashboard etc if you have already all the data available there in, in real time um, but we will later go uh, in the chapter of iot go a little bit more into the details of what exactly it is What, from your experience, would you say that this uh, type of message broker architecture is now c coming more and more into the, the industry? Yeah, especially in, in manufacturing, you see that more and more people are using it. Um, and here we always want to take this step back and understand, okay, uh, let's not really talk about MQT versus OPCUA. Let's always talk about the architecture behind it. And this architecture is used more often and often. Um, whether you use actual MQTT or Kafka or both of it, we can discuss uh, in another episode. It's then a design decision. But exactly. Uh, okay, understand. That's super interesting. I, I am looking forward to come to the next sessions with you and also dive a little bit deeper into those kind of topics. Um, for now, I would say thank you for uh, the, the insights. And um, for the listeners, if you haven't uh, followed us on Discord yet, then please do so. Let us know your feedback. Um, please let us know also, um, if you can, what kind of architecture you use in your companies. Um, also, what kind of message broker. I mean, you, Jeremy, you said that we come back to that, but maybe the listeners will already uh, let us know what kind of message broker they use and why. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to have the next session with you. All right. See you next session. Bye. Bye.